Good morning. Good morning. Nice to have Geraldine back. <laughs> we saw our car when we pulled in and we were excited. Um, Pierre's in Marguerite this morning, so you're stuck with John and I. Sorry. No. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that we can come and we can um, worship you this morning. We thank you that um, you love to hear us. We thank you, Lord, for giving us such amazing songs, Lord, um, to give us words to praise you. And we thank you for your word. And I pray, Father, that you'd bless the music and you bless the word this morning. And your spirit would be here with us this morning, um, helping us to worship you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to stand up? And start off with the classic. And like a disclaimer, I haven't really like double checked the keys, so <laughs> you never know what one of these might not turn out well, but we'll see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found Was blind but now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear in the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already that brought me with a star and grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I'm It seemed wrong to start off really slow. That's why I sped it up. <laughs> what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope only Jesus before my life is wholly bound to this know how strange and divine I can see all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark 
but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd. I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my peace. And oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. And when the race is complete, still my lips shall read Thee. morning when I was looking at this song, The Better Is One Day, yeah. Um, I don't even know if it, like, in my mind it connected. I don't know if it connects in real life, but I was thinking of, um, there's a song by Keith Green, and it's called um, You Can Run to the End of the Highway. And basically the premise of the song is, uh, you know, he's talking to one of his friends who I guess he wants to go take off and travel the world to get away from all of the bad stuff that's going on where, where he is. And, and Keith Green is like, appealing to him and saying, you know, you can run to the end of the highway and you're not going to find what you're looking for. Yeah, it's all the same from Shetty Camp to Marguerite to Dingwall to Halifax, you know, to, to Vancouver. It's all the same, right? He says, you, you said, you want to go find a place where there's no lying? He said, well, if you find a place like that, I'll go there too, right? Um, this whole earth, it's broken. Um, yeah, the church, it's broken, you know, it's beautiful. But, it, but it's broken, and there's, Jesus is the only answer, exactly. Um, and so this song I find just contrasts, you know, how great it's going to be in heaven, you know? 
how great it is with the Lord. Uh, maybe I'll go to D for this one, eh, Kara? Yep, Mark D. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, O my soul longs and even faints for you, for here my heart is satisfied within your presence I sing beneath the shadow of your wings and better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts song such a beautiful little song um talks about like the simplicity of worship you know even in the bible days we were just reading in john right with with pierre about how um the woman at the well the samaritan woman and uh you know she was caught up in the controversies intricacies of you know where are we supposed to worship are we supposed to worship here um on our mountain are we supposed to worship in jerusalem and what did jesus say like worship in, in spirit and in truth, right? That's the simplicity of worship. It doesn't have to be, you know, smoke machines and lights, or it doesn't have to be pianos and drums and guitars and bass and 
three people singing. Um, simplicity of worship is worshiping in spirit and in truth. It's worshiping with your heart. It's making melody with your heart. Um, and this song just strips all that away. All is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That'll bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself It's not what you have required You search much deeper within And through the way things appear You're looking into my heart Now I'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. The King of Endless. Word. No one could express how much you deserve. And though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself, it's not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Now I'm coming back to the heart of. And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. And I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. And I'm sorry, Lord, for the Thing I made it when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Oh, I haven't sound this song in forever. John picked the songs, so it's like a surprise. Kind of. Not really, but it is. <laughs> Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for the Thank you for the nail-pierced hands 
wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on your throne. We crown you now with many crowns. So this song is based off of um, Psalm 51. And it's like it's a psalm of repentance of David to um, to the Lord after he um, committed adultery with with Bathsheba. Um, and it's just a good it's a good prayer. You know, I said before here that like I've always I always like songs that are prayers. Um, songs that <laughs> they're just saying pray. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's you know songs that remind us to quiet ourselves and humble ourselves and. Um, you know, ask for forgiveness. Yeah, give us clean hands. Give us clean hands. And like the chor like in the chorus, some of the chords are off, so maybe it's best to do it by ear on the chorus. You guys want to stand up? <laughs> we bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn.
turn our eyes from evil things oh lord we cast down our idols oh give us clean hands give us your heart let us not lift our souls to another give us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another oh god let us be a generation that sees that seeks your face oh god of jacob oh god let us be a generation that sees that seeks your face oh god of jacob we bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit Come make us humble We turn our eyes From evil things Oh Lord we cast down our idols Oh give us clean hands Oh give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. God, let us be a generation that sees, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. God, let us be a generation that song little chorus the words aren't up there but so you guys just like sing after us I guess we'll sing it a few times through it's easy oh God you are my God and I will praise you oh God you are my God and I will ever praise you and I will seek you in the morning and I will learn to walk in your
used to be for creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand to be for my failures you carry the cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul now to stand so what could I say
incredible, Lord. You're amazing. You're, you're the only one who's worthy of all our praise, Lord. There's no one else. There's nothing else um, that even remotely compares to you, Father. Oh, Lord, take, take that place in our hearts. Steal it from whatever idols might be there now because um, you are worthy, Lord. I pray that as John speaks, Lord, that your truth would ring out through him and, and that um, you'd be speaking to our hearts. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before we start, I know um, Jack prayed a few times, but I'm going to pray one more time. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We come to you as brothers and sisters in Christ. We come to you as your children, Father. And we thank you that we can come together to worship you together. And we thank you that we have your word and that your word is truth, Father. And that your word is useful for correcting, for rebuking, for teaching, and for admonishing, Father. It builds us up. It sets us on the right path. It shows us where to walk, Father. And not just that, but we have your Holy Spirit in us, working in us, giving us strength, guiding us. And Father, I pray that um, it would be your words today. It would not be mine. I pray, Father, that you'd open up the hearts of people here and that we would take note, take warning um, as men and women of God. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be diverting from the book of John and I'm going right to the Old Testament in 1 Kings. I've read through this passage in the past before, and I remember going through it, and I was, I was kind of shocked, and I was angry at this passage. It seemed unfair. And as we go through it, maybe you'll feel that way too. If I had to sum it up, I would sum up this passage as three very important people. You have an evil king, you have a lying prophet and a disobedient man of God. So before we begin, um, one question I want you guys to ask yourselves. What is a man of God? We'll, we'll get to that eventually, but I want that to be in, your, in the back of your mind. So we're going to do a lot of reading. There's a lot of verses, but I'll break it down for you. We're going to read through the verses. Then I'm going to walk through what it's telling us. And then at the end, we're going to apply to our lives in 2023. As men and women of God, how do we apply that to our lives? So let's begin. This is 1 Kings 13. And you know what? Maybe I should do some um, historical context. So everybody knows King David, right? The great King David. He created the huge kingdom of Israel. That was the 12 tribes. His son Solomon, he was the one who built the temple. His son, Solomon's son, was a very wicked man. And God said, I am not going to keep the nation of Israel together. I'm going to split it up because of this man's sin. So he went to another man named Jeroboam. And he said, Jeroboam, if you follow my ways, if you listen to my commandments, I will give you the ten tribes of Israel. You'll have the northern kingdom, and I'll leave the kingdom of Judah still intact, but you get to have all this part of Israel to yourself as long as you follow my commandments and my laws. So what does this king Jeroboam do? Does he follow God? Does he listen to his commands? So the first thing he does is he creates golden calves and he's like, if everybody continues to go down to Jerusalem and worship God, I'll lose my kingdom. They'll eventually go back to one whole kingdom. So I'm going to establish my own gods. I'm going to make my own gods. We're going to make our own temple. And everybody will worship here in Bethel. And I'll get to keep my kingdom. Very practical. Very sinful. Sometimes some of our most practical ideas are totally against what God wants. So that gives you the context of what's happening here. This King Jeroboam is a very evil, wicked man. So we'll start in... Uh, 1 Kings 13, verse 1. By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah, the southern part of Israel, to Bethel, as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. By the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar, 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 this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests 
of the high places who make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. So he's, ta- he's prophesying to this altar that they would sacrifice to. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out, did he humble himself and say, repent, I repent, I repent. No, when a man of God cried out against the altar of Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, seize him. But the hand he had stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God, by the word of the Lord. Then the king said to the man of God, intercede with the Lord, your God, and pray for me that my hand will be restored. The cheek of this king, this guy basically just said, seize this man, basically like cut off his head. And as soon as his hand gets shriveled up, he's like, oh, please pray for me that my hand will be healed. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. Oh, that's all right. The king said to the man of God, come home with me for a meal and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, and I'm going to emphasize that, I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done there that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Um... Their father asked him, which way did he go? And his son showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. And when they had saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water here or return by the way, of the way you came. Remember, he's been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread and drink water there or return by the way you came. The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. Sounds pretty good, right? But he was lying. So what did the man of God do? Did he say, no, I'm going to listen to God's word? So the man of, he didn't. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. While they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out, he, he cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. So the prophet is now prophesying. God is speaking through him to the man of God saying, this is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your ancestors. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet had brought him back, saddled his donkey for him. As he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was left lying on the road with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. So I think when the people passed by and saw the body lying on the road with the lion standing beside the body, they went and reported it to the city where the old prophet lived. When the prophet who had brought him back from his journey heard it, he said, it is the man of God who defied the word of the Lord. The Lord has given him over to the lion, which has mauled him and killed him. As the word of the Lord had warned him, the prophet said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. And they did so. Then he went out and found the body lying on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. The lion had neither eaten the body nor mauled the donkey. 
So the prophet picked up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to his own city to mourn for him and bury him. Oh, you can go back. So it goes actually like the verse 34, but to sum it up, he tells his sons, when I die, put him in my tomb. He says, put the man of God in my tomb, and when I die, I will be buried alongside of him. And then it ends with this. It says, Jeroboam, that king, he didn't change his ways. He continued to make priests to worship to their golden calves and their idols, and he continued to do evil in the land. So if we can go back to the start, Geraldine. So that's, it's a lot of words there, guys, big story. But I think, yeah, and there's a lot of information there. But if we break it down, you guys will see that God is good and he has a warning for us as Christians today. So first off, by the word of the Lord, a man came from Judah. So the word of the Lord told this man, I want you to go to Judah and you will prophesy technically against Jeroboam and against Israel, but the prophecy is against the altar that Jeroboam is sacrificing on. Remember, Jeroboam was given the northern tribes of Israel. God said, as long as you follow my commands and you obey me, not only will I give you this, he said, I will make a dynasty out of your people, just like David. Does this, it seems almost like, like that, th this king says, forget about it. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to worship other gods. Now, what are these other gods? These gods, some of them, one of them was called Eshtereth, which was actually like a female goddess that was a consort to Baal. The other one was Chemosh. Some of these required human sacrifice. They were sacrificing humans on these altars to these pagan gods. There was a lot of evil things that were happening during this time. This was not just, you're going to the mall. This is, we are sacrificing children to these gods. Um, so God says to this man of God, I want you to go all the way north and I want you to prophesy against this man. So he goes and he says, by the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar. Altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son of man, Josiah, will be born to the house of David. Now, Josiah, this is one heck of a prophecy. Josiah, 300 years after this prophecy, a man of the house of David will be born. He's a king and he's a great king. It would be a great sermon to do on Josiah and how we should all be like Josiah. When he became king, Josiah, he went throughout the entire land and he destroyed all those temples. They would do a thing called uh, worshiping on high places. They'd go up on the uh, mountains and they would create these little shrines and they would worship and praise these horrible pagan gods. Josiah went to these high places and destroyed all of them. He also went to the, this altar this very altar, and he destroyed it as well. So the prophecy says, Josiah will be born to the house of David, and on you he will sacrifice the priests of high places who will make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. What Josiah did is that he actually took the grave sites of these horrible priests and what they did, and he dug them up and he burned the bones on this altar. This was, it seems gruesome to us, but this was God's, command and punishment for how evil these people were and how much they turned their back on God. That was the prophecy. Now, with every prophecy of God and even the word of God, God always shows a sign. He always gives us evidence. A lot of people think that Christians have blind faith. There is no blind faith. God is always, he's a good God and he always shows a sign. He gives us something for us to trust in him. And this is what he does. So, that same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. Now this altar, is it just like a small little wooden altar? No, it wouldn't be wood because it would burn. Is it just like a few stones put together? This thing was like six to five meters and it was huge cut out stone. Like this thing was huge and it would last for a very long time. You can go to the next one. When the king Jeroboam heard the man of God cried out against the altar, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, seize him. 
Again, let's, let's take a moment and look at this. This king, Jeroboam, who was given the northern kingdom by God, this would have been his chance. This was his opportunity to repent and be like, you know what? You're right. What I have done is, is sinful. It's a great sin. I'm not only sinning against God, I'm leading this entire country against God. And that's something we should always think about. If you are in a leadership position, you always have to remember that you are, you're put at a higher standard because you're not only worried about your own salvation, your own soul, but you are now influencing other people. Kings of the Old Testament, that's what they would do. They would actually be like, okay, everybody, we're going to now worship these golden calves. And everybody would worship these golden calves. This guy was in big trouble because he was causing the entire nation to sin. And he had a chance. He had a chance to repent. But instead, he said, seize him. And literally means, basically, we're going to take you and we're going to execute you right here on the spot. But the hand that he stretched out, and just think about this. This is a miracle in and of itself. As soon as he stretched out his hand to say, seize him, the hand shrivels up that he can't even pull it back. And at that very moment, that altar, which is made out of huge pieces of stone, splits apart. That's a sign from God. Just picture, if you were there, if you were watching this happen, this man of God prophesy, the king says, seize him, and his hand shrivels up, and then suddenly this huge stone thing split apart. Do you think if you were worshipping these pagan idols, you might be like, oh, maybe we should listen. Maybe we are sinning. I'm sorry, God, I repent. You would think a lot of people would repent and turn from their ways. Not one of them d did. Now, you might be thinking... Maybe God didn't give him a chance. Maybe this is just a sign, but none of them would even have a chance. There was a king in the Old Testament. He was from Judah, um, Manasseh. Uh, he was the son of Hezekiah, and he was a very wicked king. He did the same thing as Jeroboam, where he installed all these pagan idols and everything like that, and God brought judgment on him. He actually sent the Assyrians. They took over the city. They grabbed this man, and they brought him to prison. And when he was in prison, he repented and he turned back to God. He was like, God, you are the Lord. You are God. And God, he forgave him, had mercy, brought him back, brought him back to Judah. That could have happened to Jeroboam. That could have happened to all the people there. And yet, that's not what happens. So let's see what happens. This whole altar splits apart. Then the king said to the man of God, intercede with the this was the king's chance to repent and turn to God. Did he do that? No. All he cared about was his hand being healed. And what does he say to the prophet? He says, intercede with the Lord, your God, not his God. And remember this, he's, he's a Jew. He's an Israelite. He did at one point worship the Lord God. But at this point, he's like, intercede with the Lord, your God, and pray with me that my hand would be restored. All he cared about is being healed. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about um, glorifying God. He just wanted his hand to be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored. That right there is another sign of God's grace. God didn't have to heal his hand, and he did. And yet again, that's another sign. It's another miracle. So just imagine you're sitting there watching this. You see the man prophesy, the king stretch out his hand, his hand gets shriveled, then the stone splits apart, and then his hand gets healed. I would be like, whoa, <laughs> this, miracles are happening. Um, oh, if you can go back. But no, the man does not repent. This king does not repent. So the man of God interceded with the Lord, and the king's hand was restored and became as it was. So it's restored. Does he repent? Let's see what happens in the next... No, the king actually says to him, come home with me for a meal and I will give you a gift. What do you think he's doing there? Is he being like, oh, you're, I'm going to be nice to you. You're such a great man of God. Come home. I repent. I'll give you a meal. Is that what he's doing? He's bribing him. He's basically saying, look, I'm going to give you a gift. You come home and maybe you can come back later and say a good thing about my altar and maybe say, you know what? I was wrong about Jeroboam. He's a really good guy and... Um, you know, come home and I'll give you whatever you want. Money, fame, you name it, I'll give it to you. 
That's what Jeroboam is doing. There is not one sign of repentance in his heart. But the man of God answered the king, even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go, go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. Very brave. Very good. I would give that guy a 10 out of 10. He told that king, the king of the entire nation, no, I'm not going home with you and I'm not going to eat bread or drink water with you. Very good. And this is why. This is why he said that. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord. The Lord spoke to him. This is the word of the Lord. You must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. He was commanded to do that. He was commanded three things. You don't eat bread with anybody, you don't drink water, and you're not going to go home the way you came. Why? Why was he commanded to do that? That's, that's exactly right. God was so disgusted what was happening in the northern Israel. He wanted to show, I am totally separating myself from you. My man of God, when he comes, he's not going to eat bread. He's not going to drink water. He's not even going to go home the same way he came. He's going to find another route back home so nobody can recognize him. The other reason is exactly what you said. It also prevents people thinking that he is being bribed and also so he won't be bribed. He's not going to eat bread, drink water with anybody. He's going to say the prophecy and leave. And that's it. That was the purpose. So, the man of God, he took another road and he did not return by the way he had come. Now things change. Now there was a certain old prophet. Now remember, old prophet. What does that mean? If you're a prophet, what did you do? You speak the word of the Lord. You were God's mouthpiece. But one, it's strange, the other man is referred to as the man of God. This guy is referred to as the old prophet. You could be a preacher. You could be spewing out the words of God. But if your heart is not for God, if you are not loving God, if you're not a true Christian, you're not a man of God. There's a difference. So now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel. So this guy was living in that very town where all this horrible stuff was happening, worshiping these idols. And his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done there that day. So his sons were there. They are present. They heard everything that was happening. What do you think that means? Were they far off, maybe on a building like a kilometer away, and they heard the prophet prophesy? They were super close, which probably means they were actually partaking in the worship of these idols, or some scholars think they were priests themselves of these idols. They were very close to be able to hear what was happening. So the sons came back and told uh, the prophet all that had happened, um, where are we at? The sons came back and told him all that the man of God had done there that day, and they also told their father what he had said to the king. So what does this prophet do? He's like, oh, we must repent. We must turn away from these idols. Let's go to the next one. No, he says, uh, which way did he go? And, he's, and his son showed him which way the, ro the man of God went. And so he says, saddle up my donkey. And he goes and he tries to find this man of God. And he finds the man of God sitting under a tree which is good. This man is, at this point, following the word of the Lord. He's not going back the way he came. And so he asked him, are you the man of God from Judah? And he says, yes, I am. And so the prophet said to him, come home with me and eat. Why would the prophet ask that? He knew everything that the man of God said. He knew that the man of God told the king, I cannot eat bread, I cannot drink water, and I cannot even go back the way I came. The prophet knew that. Why then does he want this, this man of God to come home with him? Is it for good reasons? No. This guy, this old prophet, wants the man of God to be shamed and to fall in his sin. He wanted him to sin. Now the question is, why would he want that? Well, just think of it. This was an old prophet, and he's living in Bethel, in this town, surrounded by all this, all this uh, false worship. Did he step out and speak out against all this evil? No. 
he was living a comfortable life. It sounds like his sons were probably taking part or probably the priests themselves. So would he want to do that? No. Would he want this man of God speaking out against what's happening? No. So he had very evil intentions. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and I cannot go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. So again, the man of God is repeating the word of God back. He's saying, no, I can't, I can't go back with you. I cannot eat or drink bread. I cannot eat bread, drink water with you in this place. So very good. The man of God is doing really good at this point. Um, I have, I've been... I've been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there and return by the way you came. So he repeats, this is what the word of the Lord says. And the old prophet answered him, I too am a prophet, as you are. He makes this connection. Look, we're the same. You're a prophet, I'm a prophet. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. And he was lying. So... When I read through this and I saw what happened to the man of God being killed by the, by the lion, I was like, this is so unfair. Like, why would God kill the man of God? He was lied to. Like, he was doing so well at first. He told the king who wanted to bribe him, I can't do that. The only reason why he follows this guy home is because he was lied to. He believed him. But the truth is, is that this man of God was held at a higher standard. He heard the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord told him specifically, do not eat bread with anybody, do not drink water, and do not go back the way you came. And he did exactly that. Even though this man lied to him and he said, look, um, an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. How many times in our life have we heard somebody say this is the truth you know we've heard we live in a world of lies do we just naively be like oh yeah you know what that's true yeah murder is fine oh yeah no right what this man of god should have done is right off the bat, bat and said no the word of the lord spoke to me you're lying at the very least he could have tested him and said are you sure that you've heard from the Lord. No, he just blindly and quickly says, okay. And he goes home and he sits at the table and he eats with this man. So while they were at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet. So it's, it's amazing that God uses this old prophet, this liar, this man who is deliberately trying to do evil to the man of God, God uses him. And that's, again, another very important thing to remember that God will use anybody and anything for his purposes. Think of Balaam's donkey. He will use anything. And so he cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. So now the word of the Lord is speaking through this lying prophet. You have defied the word of the Lord and you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where, you, where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your ancestors. That was a huge, shameful thing to happen. For us in Canada in 2023, it doesn't really matter where I get buried. But for an Israelite at that time, to not be buried with your ancestors, it was shameful. Um, every king who would die, it would show, and he was buried with his ancestors. He was buried with his ancestors. It shows that this man has done something very shameful. So that was a punishment. That was a huge punishment. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him, and as he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him. Now this lion was sent by God. That was his punishment. And as, as horrifying as that sounds, what this whole passage is pointing to is that we as Christians, men of God from the Old Testament, we must take God's word very seriously. We are held at a very high standard. God's word is nothing to be played with. And so God's punishment is showed by this lion. And again, just like what he did with the, with the altar, just like he did with the hand shriveling up and then being healed, 
God shows a sign. And this is a sign not just for the prophet and his sons, it was for Jeroboam. And it was for the people of Bethel. Because it wasn't just this random lion killing. Everybody would be like, oh, people got killed by lions all the time. Something very strange happened here. The lion killed a man, and his body was left lying on the road. And the donkey and the lion were standing between him. Now, if anybody knows anything of like, if you watch, I don't know, any type of documentary on lions or any kind of predator animal, a, a lion would not just sit there after killing, would not just sit there and watch and not do anything to the donkey and not do anything to the man. And it happened for days. So you can see that this was de deliberate. This was an act of God that this man was dead. And now having the lion and the donkey on either side was a sign that this man was punished by God. And it was a sign to everybody around. So, obviously word got out, and everybody heard that this lion is standing beside the body, and the donkey is not being mauled. So they went and reported it in the city where the old prophet was. They reported it in the city. So they didn't just go to the prophet, the whole city knew about this. When the prophet who had brought him back from his journey heard this, he said, it is the man of God. Again, when I first read this, I was so angry. I'm like, it should have been the old prophet who got mauled by the lion. Why does he get off scot-free? And it's him who goes and picks up the, the body of the man of God, and then he's, he brings him back. And now again, if you read further, it says that he takes the man of God's body and he puts it in his own tomb. And then he tells his sons, when I die, lay me beside this man of God. Again, that means nothing to us. But at that time, that was very significant. He is now taking the shame of this man and he's putting it on his own family. And he's now agreeing with, a physical act of agreeing with, I believe what this man of God has said. I agree with him. So we see in the past, this, this old prophet, he was, he hid. He did not say anything against the evils that were happening. He didn't speak out against Jeroboam. He didn't speak out against the pagan worship. But in this act, he's saying, I agree with him. I would say that this is an act of repentance. Did Jeroboam repent as the verses continue? No, he continued to practice worshiping of idols. He continued to make priests, more priests, like pumping out pagan priests so more people could fall into sin. He did not repent. But as horrible as this situation is, this old prophet showed signs of repentance. What's really amazing is when you read about Josiah, the man, uh, the man that the man of God prophesied about, when he came to Bethel, he started going through all the old pagan priests' graves. So there'd be all these pagan graves, and they'd be all marked with crazy stuff, and they'd be like, destroy that grave, destroy that grave. He came to this one grave, and he, he asked the people of Bethel, whose grave is this? It probably looked different. It probably wasn't all decorated with the pagan uh, sacrificial artistry. It was different. It was probably just plain. And they said, this was the man of God who was mauled by the lion 300 years ago. They knew 300 years. They remembered that this man was killed by the lion. Take note. Did Bethel repent? Did all the people turn from their sins? They didn't. They were still practicing idols, but yet they remember what happened to the man of God. We can, we can know. We can know, oh yeah, you know, God's going to punish us. If we are uh, going to punish us for our sins, if we don't turn to him. Yeah, there's a final judgment someday. No big deal. We can know it intellectually, but it doesn't affect our hearts. The town of Bethel, they knew. They remembered, and yet they didn't repent. They didn't turn away from their sin. And so, to sum it all up and take this story, this passage, and apply it to our lives, question we got to ask ourselves is who are we or who do you want to be and really they're all not really that good first off you don't want to be King Jeroboam you don't want to be a man who was given so much and so easily turned from God for his own personal gain selfish gain greed 
but even the fact of turning from God, you do not want to be that person who turns from God. You don't want to be a man who is constantly shown mercy. The fact that this prophet came and prophesied, that was an act of mercy. If we were all walking towards a cliff and we didn't know a cliff was there and someone came out and said, John, stop, everybody stop. If you keep going, you're going to go over a cliff. Is that mercy? I'd be like, oh, thanks, buddy. I didn't know a cliff was there. And I turn back and I go the other way. But if I was walking towards a cliff and the person's like, oh, I don't want to offend them. There's a cliff over there, but uh, I don't want to hurt any feelings. And then they just kind of slowly watch us all fall over the cliff. I'd be like, well, maybe they're a coward, but they're not showing love by just watching us go over the cliff. As Christians, we were called to speak the truth, just like this man of God did. We were called to speak the truth to our communities, to our families, to our friends. And it's a fight. It is a fight. So don't be King Jeroboam. Are we going to, do you want to be the man of God? Now, this guy was doing great at first. He started off um, following the word of the Lord. And this whole passage is all about following the word of the Lord. The, God commanded, I do not want you to eat bread, drink water, or go back the way you came. That's it. It's pretty simple. It's not even abstract. It's basically you physically don't eat the bread, physically don't drink water, and physically don't go back the way you came. He did great against the king. The king tried to bribe him with half. He said, I'll give you half of what I own, which for a king, that'd be like Elon Musk giving me half of what he owns, which would be quite a lot. He said no. He, he said no. This is not what the word of the Lord says. But he was tricked. He did so well, and then he stumbled so poorly by being tricked. Being tricked by a man who was claiming to be a man of God. And Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy, that even, even the elect, even God's chosen ones, we do not want to trip and fall by listening to somebody who's telling us the truth. This guy said, I too have heard from the word of the Lord through an angel. How often have we heard lies and told that this is the truth? Love is love. How often have we heard that now in, in today's media, in today's, if you turn on anything? God specifically shows us exactly what love is. And he tells us, if you want a definition of what love is, go to 1 Corinthians 13. Love is simply not love. We hear so many lies. Another lie is like, um, you can do whatever you want, you know? It's your body, you choose. As long as you're happy. Yeah, as long as you're happy, that's another one. None of our lives are our own. And that brings me to another point. The man of God, I asked you when we started, what is, what does it mean to be a man of God? It simply means you are God's man. What does it mean to be a woman of God? You are God's woman. You are owned by God. You're not your own. You don't get to choose. And that is hard, and I know it's hard. It's hard because I want my own time. I want my own time to watch Netflix or to read a book or to go for a walk. But it's not my own. If you truly are a man of God and a woman of God, your life is not your own. Now, if we go to the next part and we'll be done, we're wrapping up. Um, this is in 1 Timothy. What's really interesting is when you go to the Old Testament, it's filled with men of God. Moses was the first man called the man of God. He was God's man. We have this, the man of God that we just read about. In the New Testament, that term man of God is only mentioned for the most part once. One other time, but he was he was actually quoting the Old Testament. The only time someone in the New Testament is referred to as the man of God is in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And Paul is speaking to Timothy. Timothy was a young man, and he was given a task to start being a pastor over a church. And so Paul encourages him, and he says, But you, man of God, flee from all this. And so... I say to everybody here, but you, man of God, but you, woman of God, 
flee from all of this. What is all of this? If you read the passages before, it was false teaching. It was um, uh, the love of money. But I'm going to focus on the false teaching. That's exactly what the old prophet did. We are called to follow after truth. If you are a man of God, you fight for truth. If you're a woman of God, you fight for truth. You follow after truth. Remember, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The truth. And pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. This life we live, it's a fight. In today's dark world, we're surrounded by lies. We're surrounded by those old prophets. Now, I do believe that old prophet repented, but what he did was evil. He tried and he deliberately tried to make that man of God sin and turn away from the word of the Lord. We live in a world today where people are deliberately trying to turn us away from the word of the Lord. So as Christians, our number one job should be know the word of the Lord. There's an old, old saying, and it's true. Um, how do FBI agents, there's a lot of count, counterfeit money out there. How do FBI agents know what is counterfeit money and what is real money? Do they look at all the different types of counterfeit money? It would be unending. It's, it's limitless. There's so many different variations, so many different ways somebody can make counterfeit money. The trick and the way to know if something's counterfeit is you study the real money. You take the real bill and you know it inside and out that it's almost instinctive. As soon as someone gives you a fake piece of money, you're like, oh, that feels weird. It's lighter. It doesn't feel the same. And then you can maybe start critiquing stuff. We don't need to know all the crazy false teachings, doctrines that are heretical out there. We just need to know the Word of God. We know the truth. We know the truth. And then when we hear lies, we'll be like, whoa, that's, that's not from the Word of God. That's a lie. That's a lie. Now, what's amazing with us, we are so blessed. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We're not alone. It's not like we just need to know this knowledge and that's it. We are being protected by and guided by the Lord himself. We have God inside of us. And so are we going to be like Jeroboam that just turns our back on God? Or are we going to be continually on our knees, prayer, seeking God's face? And when we do that, he will be for us. He'll be fighting for us. Um... Maybe one more thing, just the focus on truth. And it's funny, like, it's just, it's amazing how Paul writes this to Timothy. So he says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you were made, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's baptism, guys. Remember that when all of us are baptized, we're making a public confession that we are Christ. We are God's man. We are God's woman. We're not our own. We have been born again. We were crucified with Christ, and now we've been resurrected with Christ. We make that public confession. In the sight of God who gives life to everything, now listen to this, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. What confession did Jesus make? He made the good confession. This is what Jesus said. So, Pilate says, are you a king? You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Paul is making that same argument, that as Christians we are to fight the good fight of faith, we are to always be fighting for truth. We stand up for truth, and God's word is truth. Jesus could have simply said, Oh, I'm not the king. I'm not saying I'm a king, but no. He said, you are right in saying I'm a king. And by doing that, Jesus knew he is probably giving himself a death sentence. But he stood up for truth. He is truth. And Paul makes that argument that we are to do the same thing that Jesus did to Pilate. And so with that in mind, he says, I charge you. I give you a command, Timothy. I charge you to keep this command. And what is this command? All of God's word, 
all of God's word. You keep all of God's word without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's my charge for you guys and for myself. We are not to be like that man of God in First Kings. We are not to be so easily swayed by lies, by people who are claiming to be men of God. We are to be men and women of God who know his word and can tell the difference between lies and the truth. And again, that can only happen if we are constantly on our knees praying to God and relying on his strength and relying on the Holy Spirit within us. So I'll, I'll end there um, and I'll end in just a prayer. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name and I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that um, throughout the ages, people have tried to to lie, to twist your word, Father. And some have fallen. Some have, some have fallen prey to that, Father. But we know that you keep your own. And it's you who fights for us. And we pray, Father, that we would hold on strong to you. That we would not waver, Father. That you'd give us the strength to persevere. I pray that we would have a desire to know you more, to be in your word, and to know your truth, the only truth. I pray that we would grow in our faith, that we would grow in love and kindness and gentleness, and that we would grow in sharing the truth to everybody around us, the gospel, the good news of what you have done for us, Jesus. We would not shy away from it, but that we would stand up for your word, Father. I pray that you would protect us, Father, from Satan and his, his lies, his traps, that there would be no person here that would fall prey to an old prophet who says, I too have heard from the word of the Lord. We would not fall to that, Father, but that we would walk in the ways of the Lord and that we would walk in the spirit every day, Father. I pray that you keep us. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.